different uh, incantations, whether it's Sapient Interactive, Sapient Nitro, Sapient Publicis, whatever those evolutions were, um, really, really uh, a, a fascinating and influential uh, digital agency that I was very lucky enough to go on a little bit of that journey with them uh, when my uh, Mary crew of Red Eye Chameleon Group uh, joined Sapient in 2008. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about a bit of leadership. Uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit of the marketing world, a little bit of the agency world, but what we're really gonna focus on is this concept of understanding what's more important, whether it's to be uh, the right, to be the best or to be the best choice. And I think this is a really interesting line that's worthy of a great debate. And with that, I welcome you to another episode of OSHIP. Great. Gaston, welcome to the show. Ready? Anything for you, my friend? <laughs> I heard you uh, had a little bit of a late, late night last night. Good old, good old uh, client deadline. So I appreciate oh, you yeah. sucking it up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sucking up for us. Uh, oh, no, no, no ship moments, I hope. No, no, no. I'm a glutton for, for punishment. I know what I love to do. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it doesn't make much sense, but. Yeah, it wouldn't uh, wouldn't be the first time uh, you and I stayed up all night for some work stuff together. So I think uh, like uh, old pitch days, we'll uh, we'll you just gotta rally through the <laughs> rally through the show, and then you can go lay face down someplace. <laughs> uh, you know, I, when, before uh, before I get deep into this subject, I, I couldn't help but think about uh, you know, a little bit around how we met. Uh, and you know, way back in the day, um, I was I came in was born in two thousand four. You had, uh, you know, your digital shop. Uh, I had uh, uh, mine in South Florida. I always remember, you know, watching your guys' work. I'm pretty sure you were watching our work. Uh, and, you know, and when we finally got to meet, uh, I never dreamt that, you know, a year and a half or so later that we'd end up being kind of partners in crime uh, and kind of tra traveling all over the world together. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of people may know you as a, a, you know, a New York Times bestselling author. They see you do this great public speaking, but you also, a lot of people don't know, can be kind of a, kind of a shy guy. And I always thought my, my big mouth and, and your big brains always made a good, uh, always made for a good combo. Um, so on that note, I think, you know, today we, I'd love to dig in. Um, maybe, by, you know what, tell, tell people a little bit more about yourself and a little bit about your background. And, you know, for those who you may, may not have met you or know you before, it helps give some context to what we're going to get into today. That's always a slippery slope, Freddie. My, my uh, <laughs> introductions tend to be 20 minutes and we'll send everyone um, home. I mean, I think the short of it is, um, you know, I was a kid that uh, was in the art. It's the one thing that I could do is I could draw, I could paint and uh, wasn't very good at much else. And uh, uh, figured that I had two, two things that I could do. I could end up, you know, wearing a black turtleneck, sipping coffee and being broke. Um, and I like nice things. So I could, uh, I could be an art or in commercial art. And, um, you know, I started a, a, what was a design shop really, really early. Um, and, you know, sometimes was more lucky than good. And eventually became the largest independent digital shop in the, um, in the country when, all the big, you know, holding companies were, were, you know, looking to buy stuff and they were buying everything. And I was this like 20 year old arrogant kid. Um, and uh, I got a call once from uh, who was an idol of mine, um, you know, Clement Mock, who was the sort of original Apple designer. He was, I think Guy Kawasaki worked for him or something like that. And uh, he, he had written this book called Designing Business, um, which is something that I, I studied, so I get this call from this guy and he's like, hey, I wanna to talk to you about, you know, this company, Sapien. I'm like, who the fuck is Sapien? And uh, I met him, I remember in the Royalton in, in New York, in this, they used to have this purple bar. Um, and I thought that uh, these guys were nuts. It was a technology company that wanted to get into um, the marketing business and it went from this is nuts to this is crazy enough to work. And I think 10 days later, I sold my business to, to Sapient. Um, I mean, all kinds of stories. Like, I'm like, the, 
unless you're, we're allowed to wear jeans and bring dogs into the office, we're not selling our company. And, and uh, I expected to be there for, you know, my, I think three year earnout, And I stayed there 15, 16 years, had one hell of a ride, um, you know, found you guys and, and we, you know, we can, we can have a whole show just on, uh, just on that. So I, I just feel like I'm a Miami kid that, that got lucky uh, by by loving what I do. So pretty much well, what, the, the whole story. What, one thing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is when you look at the you know, agency slash consulting world today, it's uh, very easy to forget that when you start thinking about the mid 2000s, you know, everyone was is talking like this hybrid of creativity and technology, but no one was talking about that back then. And, you know, there was diehard creative shops. There was some diehard digital creative agencies. Um, but, you know, people, people weren't really trying to do this at scale. And, and, and building great websites does not make you a technology company. We're talking real technology, you know, folks with the, right. kind of the sapient infrastructure. And, and I'm sure I've told you this over the years, but I never forget when we were going through our own, our own process with, with you know, sapient, you were really the beginning of their transition into you know, this new type of, of organization. Before that, they were pure tech, pure consulting. I remember you talking to the vision about me and me being really, really like, because I have a, some tech roots myself, so I was really inspired by it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to throw this particular agency owner under the bus, but I remember saying to them, you know, I think I'm going to do a deal with the, with the Sapien guys. And he said, aren't those the guys that fix our printers? <laughs> like they thought they thought like it was like a pure tech because people didn't get it. They thought it was, they thought I was nuts too. It probably a little like, a few people thought you were a little nuts and people yeah. just never saw it coming. And they, they never saw this idea of, of this super disruptive convergence of these two things, um, you know, which I think is a, a great example of this kind of, maybe you know, it's not necessarily about being the best, but about being the best choice. Yeah, um, I love that way, love man. I mean, I, that is a perfect, it is around like convergence. And I think most innovation, if you think about it, and, and you know, we can talk about it from, you know, an investment standpoint, we talk about it from a talent standpoint, you can almost look at it from any, any angle. And it's, it's, it's the connection of things that's interesting, right? Um, I, I, uh, I think you were involved in this. It was, a, there was a, a a period in time when I was doing research for my book, um, where, where it was really around like the the role of story in the world is how we make sense of the world, and and we started to interview um, storytellers from other places, so chefs and filmmakers and does you know clothing designers, etc. And um, one of the things that I that one of those folks told me um, that really stuck with me is that look you know only some of us can you know dunk a basketball or can run a two minute mile or can do any of these things like you're born with you know the idea of everybody's creative um i can get that at some point but it, there are degrees of these things I, I do think that some of us and you know lack in big ways i'm a, you know i'm never going to dunk a basketball I, I assure you of this um but it they describe creativity as the ability to connect the dots. And then they said that because you've been given that talent, it's now your responsibility to go out and collect as many dots as you possibly can. Right. So I think knowing a little about a lot makes for a lot more innovation than knowing a lot about a little. Um, and, and not that we don't appreciate those craftspeople. We don't appreciate those folks that get, deep but you know if if you're an investor and you're looking at companies to invest in right if if they very clearly fit in a category don't get so excited about it when mm -hmm. when they don't know whether is this a tech company or is this a, a media company is this a with that convergence signals mm -hmm. something interesting and that's where the sole premise of of you know it's better to be the best choice sometimes than to be the best at anything because being the best at anything means that you're not very good at a lot of other things. Mm. Um, so I, think, I don't know if that's yeah, helpful, but. No, no it is. And, and um, I, you know, I just want to kind of lay this framework out a little bit better for anyone who may be watching right now. You know, why is it important to have a conversation about uh, 
you know, is it better to be the best or to be the best choice? And I think that a lot of times, uh, and I can talk through my own, you know, my own personal life, and I'm sure I am confident Gaston feels the same way. Uh, there's been times where I've been very obsessed and very hyper focused, where I, I, whether it was my own OCD or my own drive, or just a general sense of competitiveness, to want to find one thing and be truly exceptional at it. And I think that is a, an incredible thing to do. Um, and I think when you're a creative person and you're, and you're a craftsman, you, you wanna go for that, right? But a lot of what we talk about on our ship is having to do with business, it's having to do with leadership, it's having to do with entrepreneurialism and being uh, you know, a great business leader, being a successful company. And I think you know, being able to um, separate yourself from that look through their eyes and have, uh, whether it's empathy or just a, a true understanding of the kind of problems that clients have. Um, by the way, and that client could be, if you're a professional services company, it could be some, you know, some kind yeah. of consulting or marketing. It could be a product you're developing, but you know, just trying to really take, um, uh, being self-aware to understand what all the different factors are um, and, and narrowing down on being the best choice versus being air quoting here, the best um, is something that I think everyone should kind of challenge themselves to do. And, and it's something you have to kind of be able to take a very honest and self uh, reflective measure of mm -hmm. yourself, your company, your leadership, your team, um, you know, as you start to analyze, um, are you the best, are you the best choice? Um, can you think about some of the other ways that, uh, you know, maybe this was applied uh, at, at, at Sapien or even, or even any, or even your new business, uh, Gaston, yeah. like when you start to think about, you know, this, this kind of evolution, I assume that like, you know, Sapien was probably the first time you thought this way, I'm guessing, or were you, or do you, would you call that an inflection point? Well, it was definitely, um, I don't think I knew any better until, until that. And I, and I felt like a lot led me to that place but you didn't know it until you got there, right? Um, uh, like yeah, what you just mentioned. Yeah, like you just mentioned. I remember, you know, I was I, I was a young kid. I, I, you know, I had my own business, um, and constantly I was seeking um, advice and approval from from others. And you would always get the, you know, stick to what you do best. Don't get distracted. Focus is important. Um, and for, you know, an ADD person like myself that, you know, uh, it, it, easy to understand, hard to do. And, and, and I always thought that that was a flaw, right? And that ended up being what was, what was interesting. And specifically, I was always like, I would always get this from, from folks that were much more successful and much more experienced than I. They would be like, you either pick whether you're going to be an advertising agency, a creative agency, or you're gonna do technology. You need to pick one of those two things because there's no way um, that you're gonna be able to be great at any of those things, right? And the, the irony is, and, and, and Freddie, you were part of this, 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 uh, this run. When we, you know, we sold PGI to Sapien, I think we were just shy of about $40 million business, right? So, you know, building a $40 million business when you don't know what the hell you're doing, you know, that's a, that, that's a whole show, you know, in of itself. But, you know, we took a $40 million business to a $400 million business in a matter of like three or four years. That's insanity. Yeah, that's insanity. Crazy. And what was interesting, I, I got a great haircut. and you looked at it, no, but you, but you looked at it and it was, it was our win rates were in the 80%. Like we would win eight out of, 10 things that we would pitch. Just think about the craziness. And it was interesting. And the, and the scenario played out all the time. We were, uh, you know, redesigning a website for a big company or a big Adobe AEM implementation that was, you know, $10 million. And we were competing with, you know, Accenture and some of the, the you know, Indian companies, Emphasis or, or whatever on one side. And then, you know, an RGA or an AKQA, right? And what would happen is that we didn't have, and credibility and capability are not necessarily 
like I've been in business for a long time. There are so many times where my capability exceed my credibility. And there's been lots of times when my credibility exceeds my capability. But we were in a, a scenario where we were never gonna be seen as creative as an RGA, you know, and Bob and those guys, I have crazy respect for them. And we were never gonna be seen, you know, strong as a technologist as an IBM, but we won eight out of 10 times because we were the best choice. We weren't a bunch of technologists that didn't understand marketing and how this stuff was gonna happen. And we weren't a bunch of right brain folks that didn't understand systems thinking and recognize that these investments needed to be able to pay back, right? So, and, and, you, and you think about it, it's kind of an obvious thing, right? Just think about how you choose who you marry or who you, you know, it's, you could think about an extreme, you know, they can be really fun and they can be really outgoing. They can do all of this stuff. And then you can have one that, that, you know, can really have family values and all of this kind of stuff. The right answer is in the middle, right? Because that's how we're, and, and I, I'm telling you every decision happens that way. Um, uh, and, and, and it's something that we learned we learned, and when we when we started to see, when we sold the business to publicists, they started dismantling. They're like, let's put the creatives over there. Let's put the technologists over there. Let's put the media people over there. And the whole thing crashed and burned yeah. because no one was comfortable in the gooey stuff in the middle, but that's really where the value came from, right? I, I, I give you yeah. a, a really specific example of that, that I, I left a lasting impression on me. Um, you know, when, when at I Chameleon, when I had my, my little agency, you know, we biggest deal we ever did was probably a million dollars. Then we started, you know, doing things at, at Sapient where we were doing deals that were $30 million and $40 million a year and, you know, a completely different weight class. And I remember that I had been selected to lead the pitch process to to do the rostering when, when Unilever went from, what was it, hundreds of agencies down to five yeah. global agencies, which was a pretty big deal for me. Yeah. And I remember being in London with another actually great creative director, Gary Hoff, and a couple other team members, and and we're in there pitching, and we come in really strong on creative because we we felt this was it was really about the creative agencies. We actually had, were already on the roster for technology, right. and and I remember being in the meeting, and I could actually I could tell we were losing. Basically, I was like, we're not we're we're going up against some of these super heavy hitting creative crews, and I and I could sell this. I was like, we're not going to win this. And I remembered making a very uh, ballsy decision at the time to basically tell them, like, why should we go with you? And I'd look the guy straight in the eye, or the team, their, their team straight in the eye, and I said, just want to be clear, we're not, we wouldn't be the best creative shop on, on the roster. And I remember almost feeling like Gary kind of go, oh, <laughs> you know, and say, but I think there's no one on the roster that understands the mixture and the crossover of creativity and technology that we do. Yeah. And for, and I said it to a point blank that I understood what his choices were or their choices were. And I said, I know that we will fill a gap that you don't have if you have five agencies. Mm -hmm. And sure as hell we ended up on that roster. Um, I'm not whether, you know, I know that we obviously did a lot of our merit, but I also think making them understand the best choice versus being the best um, in that case resulted in potentially hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue for safety. So and, and the irony is that being the best choice ends up be, you end up being the best. Being the best. At, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you look back at that time, it was what, you know, 30% of all e-commerce in North America went through stuff that we designed. And I think we won like, you know, 800 canned lions and God knows how many Grand Prix. You know, so, so it, 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 it wasn't an, you know, it wasn't an or, it was an and. And I think that that's really what's, what's interesting is is you know this stuff is a team sport you know and it, it and you need you know we, we talk so much about diversity um and the value of diversity and and um you know I, I i truly believe in that but i think there's another dimension which is more about diversity of perspective and diversity of thought and um that that makes those connections going back to collecting dots right um you know i've, I've often been accused uh maybe by you of being a collector of interesting people, um, you know? And, uh, um, and, and while that gives you some, he some heartache, um, it, it, it's paid off over time. I, I think it really has.
So, so uh, thinking about this, you know, we went off on a, on a tangent That's as you right. and I are doing a good tangent, thank God. Uh, so, you know, when when you think about your new business, so you you Glue's been around for how many years now? Four, Just three, two and a half years now. Yeah, two and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Um, not, not long. You, know, you you gone out there. You've masochistically masochistically jumped back into the agency world, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, have you have you tried to apply some of these kind of learnings and thinkings to your new business because it is a new landscape now, and is there is there a best choice now versus maybe what the best choice was then? Certainly. I mean, I think that 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 is core to the thesis, not, not just in, in how we're kind of designing and building our business and our culture, but really how I approach client work, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, just even, you know, through, through COVID, some of the, you know, some of the things that we've been involved in, whether it's, you know, um, Neiman Marcus or, or uh, Jenny Craig, like a business that um, totally brick and mortar and, and being able to, you know, help, help those people save jobs and save their businesses and, and that sort of thing. We, we do a lot of kind of go to market strategy, product market fit, positioning, that sort of thing. And we're constantly looking for that best choice, right? Is recognizing that, you know, what is the right way? What is, what is the thing that you're going to say and do that will capture market share and will capture whatever? And, and it works. It really, it really, it works. It works time and time again. You know, we are, we are emotional um, beings that, that, that struggle with the rational, you know, we make decisions here and we rationalize them there. And if you understand, you know, I've always said that if you understand how people tick, you know, what makes people tick, and you have a good sense of technology and what's happening in the world, you can help anybody. You know, um, you could, whether it's a startup or a Fortune 500 company or a nonprofit, you can help anybody. So I think we definitely apply that to, to that. I'll, I'll give you a very direct example. And this one, you and I share because we spent a lot of time talking about this. I think, you know, when, when, when I left uh, Publicity, whatever the hell it was called at the time, Right. Um, I was, you know, I was basically in garden leave going to go take a big consulting job. And just the fact that I was like a creative guy and I ended up, you know, doing that was crazy. But I either chickened out or lost my mind. And I still haven't figured out which one of those two things were. But it was sort of wanting to being so proud of what we had accomplished and starting to see it being dismantled. It was almost kind of like voting with your feet. And I was, I was a lot less precious about what we did and much more precious about how we did it and who we did it with, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that there's where the, the, the best choice thing. One of the things that we both acknowledge, you and I spoke a lot about this, was that you know the big agencies, the big holding companies, the big consultancies, felt like they were they were fighting for share with each other and right underneath their nose it's they had jumped the shark all clients were building internal capabilities because you know what used to be a symbiotic relationship it used to make sense you know if you were a, if you picked up the phone and called David Ogilvy help me grow my business you know or i want to capture this market or i want to take this guy out you know whatever it is it was good business to hire a good agency. You made money. It was good business decision, and it was good. It was good business for them. At some point, it stopped. It stopped working that way. It became parasitic relationships. It's just time and materials and billing hours and not getting anything. And I think that that designing a company that was built to fit into that new place, you know, which is saying, look. Uh, let's talk about the best choice again, right? So like bringing it back to the, to the point, which is outsourcing to an agency, the engine that drives your business is insanity. So everybody that's watching, it's insanity, <laughs> right? Staying at a Holiday Inn Express last night and think that you can do it all by yourself, that is just as stupid, right? 
So the right choice is somewhere in the middle. And I know, Freddie, I know you've been working on doing that. You know, I know I've been working on doing that. We have similar it, takes and differences, I mean, I, but that's I, crazy important. It's crazy important. You know, I never really thought about it until, frankly, having this conversation. There's something that we've been doing at Community Collective that is, I, I, I frequently joke, is counterintuitive and seems like it would be really bad for our business. And, you know, maybe it's because it's the best choice for, for the client at the end of the day has led to us having, you know, tremendous amount of growth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, uh, we have interim leaders and we've got, a, you know, a bunch of folks that we can airdrop into companies, as you know, mm -hmm. we've got all these kind of executionally focused folks that we can go and support those leaders and kind of get big jobs done. But the thing that we um, do that I think is very different is we, those things are more like you've got like a staff org and, and, and almost like agency consulting as fun functions. But then we've got these seven recruiters. And so a lot of like our value prop to clients is that we, we can help them solve these big problems or do these turnarounds, but we effectively fire ourselves. We work ourselves out of a job. We give them the capability. We teach them how to do it and then we remove ourselves from the equation. Um, and, you know, as I frequently joked, you know, this is potentially the world's worst business model for, yeah. for an agency or consulting firm to constantly, you know, put yourself on the outs with your client. But again, by making ourselves um, the right choice, it maybe it, it doesn't, um, it's, you know, not about us being the best in any of these classes, but it, it's something that people have been able to very logically go, well, that's actually what I really want. That's the problem I'm really trying to solve. And and it's and it's led to a lot of a lot of success for us. Thanks, thanks. Well, I mean, no, I think no. there's there's, no, no, no. there's real there's real brilliance. In there. I know that I know this show is a little ship, and you always want you know w us to, to go in there and say like, hey, looking back, you know, what are the big lessons that you that you learned and the mistakes that that you made, and um, and I you know I think you were there for a big part of it to witness some of this stuff. For me, I was this like you know, kid from Miami that used to, you know, I was going to go to, went to art school and that kind of stuff. And, and I felt like I was a bit of an overachiever already. Right. So like, I, I felt like I was, you know, I, I was pretty lucky. And, and when I sold my business to, to Sapient, um, two things happened. One is I suddenly had a little bit of money in the bank and the stress that comes with trying to just keep up went away right um it went away and and i signed up for something right it was it was a it was a purpose-driven organization like we were we decided to do something that we thought was meaningful um and it was like to turn that 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 category on, on its end and you know nothing worth doing is easy so like we started doing that and i feel the fact that I was not worried about me. I like, I used to tell, you know, like Alan, my boss or Jerry before that I'm like, I try to get fired every day, you know? <laughs> like it, it was, no, but it was one of these <laughs> things where I was, I was in there and I was not worried about me. I was worried about the impact that I was creating, you know, for getting, you know, I signed up to get a bunch of technologists to learn about the power of storytelling, right? Like that is a pretty audacious thing. And I feel like I had an amazing run because I wasn't worried about what that meant for me. You know, as I got older and I, and I believe that this is, is that it's an issue is as I got older and I accomplished more, you know, and maybe had a little less dry powder in the bank, I started playing it safe. And I think I became less effective. You know, I think I became less effective. I think I made decisions that I wouldn't have made, you know, I'm happy to talk about some of those things. And then, you know, you get a chance to reflect and you're like, I'm still young. I get to do it over again. And I'm setting up a company that I'm super proud of. Like, I think that the job that I was trying to do just never got done, you know? So, so it's not, this isn't that hard, right? So I think that, but, but it is, again, it's going back and saying, you know, what are the what are the great bits that you want to keep and what's the stuff that you just have the balls to throw away you know and and the underlying financial model of what a what a holding company is today does not work 
right? Um, clients right. building huge internal, you know, capabilities does not work. Does mm -hmm. not work. See what's happening because of COVID, right? You know, I spent the first year or so getting pulled in, helping clients, you know, look at people prostitute, build their internal capabilities, make them better. Always conversations around how do we manage creative people because they're crazy. That's a whole other show that we could do, right? <laughs> that is oh, a whole other show. But, I should get a group that, of my creative people. But doing that, that, that kind of thing. And, and so what's happened is unfortunately because of COVID, you know, furloughs, layoffs, that sort of thing. And, and I, can, I can give you a list of clients that I know are doing comp sales to growth to whatever with half the people that they were having. So I don't think those jobs are coming back, you know, very quickly. And, um, and then I think that gives op opportunity for, you know, new boutiques like what we're building to, to step in and provide a better mousetrap, you know, a, be, a better choice, you know. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, yeah, a little bit of a pitch for your business and hopefully- I, I, I like your idea of a side note of a ha having an episode all about kind of, you know, managing creative teams and creative teams being crazy. I think we could, we could you know, invite, we could do like a first split screen, oh ship, get you, Nemo, a couple of the other guys on and, uh, uh, you know, see if we can have, get the band back together and have a chat about it. Uh, you know, one of the things that caught my eye as we were reflecting on, um, you know, different guests I've had and, and you know, mentioning to, to Juan Carlos Morales, who's been in, you know, part of Camillion Collective and obviously has worked for you at different parts of his career. Um, Don't let us that a lot of the ex-Sapient Nitro crew all ended up becoming you know, creative leaders at some of the biggest agencies in the world, pretty much all simultaneously at one point, which I thought was pretty wild on a side note. Yeah, it, it, Jose, who's now at PwC, like pointed yeah. that out to me not too long ago. He was trying to set up a panel or something. It was like, you know, uh, part of like my core team, it was, you know, chief creative officer at, was it Deloitte at uh, uh, Accenture, PwC, you know, folks at McKinsey, like there, it was all our crew, you know. Yeah. So it means, you know, we either did something well or we really bullshitted our way through uh, a lot of it. So one of, the, one of the one of the two things. <laughs> so just just as a final thought, and we're getting close yeah. to time, and I just want to be conscious and thankful again for all the people tuning in right now. Um, Going back to that kind of core theme of, you know, is it, is it better to be the best or the, you know, the, the better choice? Um, you know, we've talked about companies, which I think in, a, in effect are a team affair anyway, but when you start thinking about this lens of getting better at this, as you've, as you've kind of evolved personally, you know, over the last you know, blurry decades of, of, yep. of kind of learning from this insight, is this something that's easier to apply when you like in a team as a team affair or, you know, if you're a solo operator, does the same kind of, you know, is it you know, easier, is easier to be the best if you're one or if it being a choice, is that so you beat a team under? Does it not really matter at all? Um, you know, I just, I just, I, I can't no, I, help I, but No, I actually, I think, I think it matters quite, it matters quite a bit. Um, and it, it matters quite a bit. And it's, um, so imagine you were going to hire a, a uh, contractor to like do something in your house, mm -hmm. right? If, or an architect's even a better, a better example to design, you know, a new wing on Freddie House estate, the Freddie Laker estate, because, uh, you know, the, the, you're becoming oh, famous right. with all this, all this stuff, right? And um, so, so you're talking to two different contractors or two different architects, but, one of the architects, you know, dad or mom was a, a contractor and they know how this stuff was gonna get built. Who's the better choice, right? So it's one of these things where I think that the difference between, let's say managing creatives, the difference between a, a, an, a senior art director and a creative director has nothing to do with creative. It's about leadership skills. It's about being able to translate business needs into, you know, apply creative solutions to doing that, right? It's, it's um, 
it, it's those connections. It's it is it is that plus skill that you have that actually makes you great. So if you're like, all I'm gonna be, do is be the best at, you know, being a leader, right? Mm -hmm. And it's all about leadership skills, but you lack vision, no one's gonna mm -hmm. follow you. You know, yeah. if, you're, if you're the best coder in the world or the best designer in the world and you're an asshole and no one wants to work with you, right? The bedside yeah, manner stuff is important. Of that. <laughs> we know a bunch of those, right? But, in the, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's you know, if, if you're a, you know, if you're if you're a technologist and you and you and you're interested in marketing, you know, there's a it, so so I do think that that convergence, those connections, are crazy important, and that's why you end up being the best choice, right? You know, when you're hiring somebody, just think about you know when you're hiring somebody, um, there there are you know lots of biases on some very unfortunate. They're all very unfortunate. Right, but if um, you're hiring a marketing manager and um, she came from JP Morgan and she came from Procter and Gamble, you know, when they come in and interview with you, you know, in Zoom, you don't ask the same questions. You, you think about, about a bunch of things and then you think about what is that other perspective that that, may, that person may have that brings it to me Right, we were, we talked about like dating earlier. If you watch like the Bachelor or something, right? It's like you know those those famous speeches at the end, and you're like, you know, you and I are exactly the same, and you know we believe all the same things, and we like all the same things. But I'm gonna pick her because she makes me better, right? So it's that's why the, the you know you know what I'm saying. I think I think that that's that's the magic. It's just sort of understanding that that convergence, you know, so someone that solves something for you or that you can solve for them, but also solve something else, yeah. that's not a bad thing. Yeah, well said. Um, I think that's a really great, perfect kind of aspiring moment to kind of call it today. Uh, I, before I uh, kind of close out and thank you, Gaston, I just have to call this strange oh shit moment. You know, I've joked a lot of uh, times over the last couple of episodes about, you know, what the hell is going on with my vision. And I can see the little window where, you know, Gaston and I are talking, you know, while I'm chatting with all of you. And I keep looking at this thing on the front of my shirt. I was like, what the hell is on the front of my shirt? Did I spill something there? It's too small for me to realize it, or my vision's gone to crap. Yeah, it's been the O'Ship logo the entire time, and I've been quietly trying to push it off my shirt when I realize it's actually in the video. Anyway, uh, so for those of you who are watching on, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, thank you very much for tuning in. If you're want, listening on our, our newly released podcast, Thank you very much as well. Uh, Gaston, you know, got mad love for you, mate. Always fun to catch up with one of my friends. Even more fun sometimes to share with other people who may find um, this kind of stuff interesting. So thank you for making time, especially knowing as tired as you are today. Go have a, a nice drink and, and go to bed early, please. And I look forward to seeing you soon. All right, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, um, thanks for indulging me. Anytime, my friend. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>